Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This module deals with the various ion channels that are present on the cell membrane. However, before we go into a detailed discussion about the various ion channels, let's look a little bit at what we have studied before about the cell membrane, about, mem about proteins that are there on the cell membrane. Let's also look at uh, a little bit about membrane transport and see where uh, ion channels fit in in the overall scheme of membrane transport. Now let's look at one way of classifying proteins that are present on the cell membrane and that is proteins can be classified either as peripheral proteins, they can be classified as integral proteins or lipid anchored proteins. We know that peripheral proteins do not extend into the hydrophobic core of the membrane whereas integral proteins extend into the hydrophobic core of the membrane. A particular type of integral protein is something called a transmembrane protein. A transmembrane protein extends across both layers of the cell membrane. So a transmembrane protein will span the outer layer as well as the inner layer. Now this is important because ion channels are transmembrane proteins. Ion channels are proteins, they are made up of many subunits. Each of these subunits will surround, or all these subunits together will surround a central pore which can be thought of to be like a channel through which ions pass through. So ion channels are transmembrane proteins. Now let's look a little bit more about the structure of the cell membrane. When we look at the cell membrane, we know that it is a lipid bilayer. We know that it has a hydrophilic outer end and a hydrophobic inner core. Now, you must have already learnt that and used this term selectively permeable. We know that the membrane provides shape to the cell, it provides protection to the cell. But another important function of the cell membrane is that it acts as a barrier. The cell membrane prevents substances from freely crossing from the outside in or vice versa and therefore it is able to keep the inside of the cell or the intracellular fluid at a different composition than that of the extracellular fluid. For example, we know that the intracellular fluid has more potassium or it is a potassium rich fluid as compared to the extracellular fluid which has much more sodium as the predominant positive ion. Now all this is possible because the cell membrane or the lipid, lipid membrane acts as a barrier. If this were not so, if the lipid membrane did not act as a barrier, very soon the concentrations of the insides of the cell would very quickly mirror that of the outside of the cell and we would not be able to keep the inside separate from the outside. Now there comes a time when substances need to cross the cell membrane. They need to bypass this barrier or pass right through it. And how does this happen? There are three broad ways in which this can happen. And they are what I'm going to show you now. The first is simple diffusion. If a substance is lipid soluble, it can pass through the membrane just by simple diffusion. The second is diffusion that happens through ion channels. So we talked about ion channels and ions which cannot pass through the cell membrane normally can pass through this pore that is present within the ion channel. And the third broad type of membrane transport is transport that occurs through proteins that are called carrier proteins. Let us now look at diffusion that happens through the cell membrane. For diffusion to happen through the cell membrane, the substance must be lipid soluble. This is a passive process 
it occurs from a region of a higher concentration of the substance to a region of a lower concentration of the substance across this membrane. It is a passive process in that there is no external energy required because the energy that is required for diffusion is already present in the concentration gradient. So diffusion is a passive process, occurs along a concentration gradient from the higher to a lower concentration and for this the substance must be lipid soluble. Substances such as oxygen, carbon dioxide and steroid hormones are lipid soluble and they can pass through the membrane by simple diffusion. Whereas substances such as ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, etc., glucose, water, these are not freely soluble in the lipid and they need some other mechanism to cross the membrane. What are those mechanisms? So, in a region or for a substance which cannot dissolve through the lipid membrane, the way it crosses the membrane is either through ion channels or through carrier proteins. We will discuss more about ion channels now, but we will also discuss carrier proteins in a little more detail. What do you mean by carrier mediated transport or carrier proteins? Before we go into this, let's look at a broad classification of membrane transport. One of the ways of classifying membrane transport is to classify it based on whether it requires energy or not. So we could classify membrane transport first into passive transport or active transport, where passive transport does not require any energy, whereas active transport requires energy in the form of ATP. Now passive transport could be either osmosis or diffusion. Osmosis is the movement of water, mo water molecules and diffusion is a movement, is a passive movement of substances from their higher concentration to a lower concentration along the concentration gradient. Diffusion itself could have three types. You could have simple diffusion through the lipid film. That is what we just discussed. You could also have simple diffusion through ion channels, or you could have diffusion with the help of a special protein, which is called facilitated diffusion. When we look at active transport, we could further, dis further classify this into primary active as well as secondary active transport. The details of this we will discuss later. But what I want to draw your attention to is this set of transport, primary active, secondary active, as well as facilitated diffusion, which all require a carrier protein and therefore they are called carrier mediated transport. So when we're talking about carrier proteins, this is for primary active transport, secondary active transport, as well as for facilitated diffusion. It's important when we look at transport across an ion channel that we remember that the movement is simple diffusion. It's simple diffusion where a substance is moving from an area of its higher concentration to an area of its lower concentration and it does not require energy because the energy is present in the concentration gradient. We will now begin a study of ion channels in more detail. But before we start this study, whenever we consider any ion channel, there are four basic questions that we should keep in mind. We should ask ourselves, what is the ion that passes through this ion channel? Is the ion channel specific for that particular ion? What is the function of this ion channel in the normal physiology or in a diseased state? And when an ion passes through this ion channel, how is the flow through this ion channel regulated or what is the gating? So let's begin. Ion channels in the body are present for all major ions. So if you look at the major ions that we see in the body, we have sodium, potassium, calcium, protons and chloride and each of them has a specific ion channel for itself. So when we look at what ion passes through the channel or we're looking at the specificity of the channel, the first type of channels are specific or ion specific channels. So we have ion specific channels which are there for sodium, potassium, 
calcium, chloride and protons. Now, there are other channels which permit a similar type of ions to pass through and those are non-specific channels. Now, an example of these non-specific channels are non-specific cation channels. So, a non-specific cation channel permits any cation, sodium, potassium or calcium to pass through. A non-specific monovalent cation channel permits only monovalent cations, that is sodium and potassium to pass through. So, when you talk about specificity of an ion channel, you could have ion specific channels or you could have non-specific channels and important among the non-specific channels are non-specific cation channels and non-specific monovalent cation channels. As we deal with the different ion channels in physiology, we can come back to this classification and find out whether the ion channel is a specific ion channel for a particular ion or whether it's non-specific, monovalent or non-specific cation channels. We will now look at how the flow of ions through these channels is regulated. This is sometimes called gating. We can broadly divide ion channels into channels that are regulated or gated or channels that are not regulated or non-gated channels. What do we mean by a gate? When we talk about a gate, we are talking about some structural component on the channel that regulates flow through the channel. A non-gated channel does not regulate the flow of ions through it. Non-gated channels are also sometimes called constitutively open channels because they are open at all times. They are not regulated, there is nothing that can stop this ion movement and ions will continue to move as long as the electrochemical gradient for that particular ion is favorable. It is these kinds of channels that contribute to the resting membrane permeability for the different ions. On the other hand, gated channels have a gate that regulates ion flow through it. Depending on what opens or closes the gate or what affects the gate, we could have voltage gated channels, we could have ligand gated channels or we could have stretch activated channels. Now in each of these cases, voltage or a ligand or stretch will cause opening or closing of the gate thereby affecting ion movements through this channel. We will now look at a classification of the different ion channels and this classification or categorization of ion channels was something that is put together by Dr. Satya Subramani. This deals with most of the ion channels that we come across in studying while studying human physiology. So uh, although you may not have come across most of these channels if you are studying physiology for the first time, every time you come across an ion channel you could look at this classification and see where it fits in. So, what we have in this entire classification is we have the ion channels or the selectivity in this column and along the rows we have the different ways in which each ion channel is gated. For example, a potassium channel, we have the open potassium channels which are constitutively open, we have voltage gated, we have voltage gated by depolarization or voltage gated by hyperpolarization and so this particular classification helps us sort out each ion channel that we find in terms of both its selectivity as well as in terms of its gating. Let's begin now by starting with an interesting ion channel which is the leak potassium channels. So these are potassium channels and what about their gating? These are constitutively open or they are not gated. Now, what more do we know about them? Their selectivity is for potassium. Where are they present? They are present on most cells of the body. What is the role of this channel? This channel, because it is open at all times, this channel contributes to the membrane permeability for potassium. So if this channel is present on a cell, it will make that particular cell permeable to potassium. And when you study about the uh, when you study about the resting membrane potential, you will realize that the potassium permeability contributes in most cells to the resting to the resting membrane potential. So the leak potassium channels contributes in many cells 
to the resting membrane potential because it contributes to the potassium permeability of the cell. Now let's look at the neuronal action potential and the ion channels that we study, the next few ion channels that we study, we'll see what is the contribution of these ion channels to the neuronal action potential. We have just seen the leak potassium channel and we have said that the leak potassium channel contributes to potassium permeability of the membrane and this potassium permeability is important for maintaining the cell's resting membrane potential, especially in a neuron. Now, let's look at the next channel, which is the voltage-gated sodium channel. Let's take a moment and look at how these ionic currents are actually recorded. That's commonly done by the patch clamp technique. And what is done is a cell is taken and placed inside a petri dish or inside a bath. And this bath is filled with a fluid which is similar to the extracellular fluid. This bath has an electrode. So there is now an electrode that is outside the cell. A glass pipette is taken onto a pipette holder and this glass pipette is filled with a solution that is similar to the intracellular solution. This entire apparatus is placed on a microscope and with the help of a manipulator, the glass electrode is placed over the cell and the cell is touched and when a slight suction is applied, the membrane breaks and the cell now becomes continuous with the fluid that is inside the pipette. So we now have the intracellular fluid which is inside the pipette and inside the cell and we have the extracellular fluid which is outside the cell. We have an electrode that is outside the cell, we have an electrode that is outside the cell and we have an electrode that is within the cell. And it is now possible with the help of electronics to apply a voltage between these two electrodes and therefore we are applying a voltage across the membrane. Now, when we apply a voltage across the membrane, we can then look at the different ion channels that open or close or the different currents that are seen across the membrane at these different voltages. So, this graph shows a typical way in which these experiments are conducted, where we have voltage on one axis and time on the other axis. And the membrane is put through different voltage steps or the membrane is held at each of these different voltages for a particular period of time and then the current that develops at that particular voltage is recorded. There are some conventions that are commonly used. An outward current is generally shown as a positive deflection and an inward current as a negative deflection or a negative current. So, if you have the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid, if you have a positive ion moving outside or if you have current moving outside, that is shown as a positive current. And if you have current moving inwards or a positive ion moving inwards, that is shown as a negative current. What are the sources of these currents? So, what I've shown here is the different commonly occurring ions that are seen in the uh, extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. So, when sodium moves from the outside to the inside, that is a positive ion moving inwards or that's an inward current which is shown as a negative deflection. When potassium channels open, very often we have potassium moving outwards, that is a positive ion moving outwards and that causes an, a current which is shown as a positive current. Now, a positive ion moving outwards is electrically equivalent to a negative ion moving inwards and when chloride moves inwards also, that is similar to a current moving outwards and that is also shown as a positive deflection. When calcium moves in, that's an inward current, that's also shown as a negative deflection. Now, we must keep in mind that the different currents that are shown here are examples of currents flowing through these different channels. There are many types of ion channels and their profiles or their shapes are different, but these are common examples of how these currents would look. A typical recording of these currents is something that's shown in this animation, where we have the voltage that's applied to the cell shown on top and the current that is developed shown below. So as different voltages are applied to the cell, uh, 
a family of currents is seen and an analysis of these currents helps us identify what is the type of current or the type of ion channel that is present on the membrane. Let us now begin with a study of the voltage gated sodium channel. Now what do we know about the voltage gated sodium channel? We know that it's voltage gated or it opens with a depolarization of the membrane above a certain threshold. What about its selectivity? It is selective for sodium. Where is it present? It's present on neurons, skeletal muscles and in the heart. And you will realize that these are tissues or these are cells that can have an action potential. What is its function? The voltage gated sodium channel is important or is responsible for creating the depolarization or the upstroke of the action potential. And this action potential, specifically at the action potential in the neurons, in the skeletal muscle and in cardiac muscle cells, voltage gated sodium channels do not cause the action potential in pacemaker cells as we will see later. So how do you block these channels? Local anesthetic such as lidocaine blocks the action potential in neurons and therefore they can block nerve conduction. So the depolarization or the upstroke of the action potential is caused due to opening of voltage gated sodium channels above a threshold voltage. Now if we were to look at the different voltages that we put the membrane across and the different currents that pass by or that passed through, we will see that at a hyperpolarized voltage somewhere at minus 120, minus 100, minus 80 or minus 60, the channel remained closed. But once we crossed the threshold somewhere near minus 55 millivolts, we see that there is a current that develops and as we talked about the convention, we said that when sodium enters in or an inward current is shown as a negative deflection, so you start seeing the current developing. So this shows you that the current was opened with voltage. So this is a typical IV profile or a current voltage profile of a voltage gated sodium channel. You will learn more about the voltage gated sodium channels when you discuss the neuronal action potential. Another channel that can cause depolarization to the membrane is voltage gated calcium channels. And there are two types of voltage gated calcium channels that we will talk about, the L-type calcium channel and the T-type calcium channels. So these are calcium channels and they are voltage gated. Let's learn a little bit more about them. So what do we already know? We know that they are gated by voltage or when the membrane depolarizes above a particular threshold, these channels open. They are selective for calcium. What are the types? You have the L-type calcium channel and the T-type calcium channel. Where are they present? They are present on cardiac muscle, cardiac pacemaker cells, axonal endings and vascular smooth muscle and the T-type calcium channels are present on the cardiac pacemaker cells. Both the L-type calcium channel and the T-type calcium channel are important for the pacemaker action potential and the L-type calcium channels when you study about conduction at the neuromuscular junction, we realize that the L-type calcium channels are present on the axonal endings. So the L-type calcium channels is a way in which calcium from the extracellular fluid can enter the cell. Now the calcium that enters the cell is important for many cellular processes such as exocytosis and it happens through the L-type calcium channels in many situations. Let us now look at the next type of channel that is the delayed rectifier potassium channel. As its name suggests, it is a potassium channel and this is also voltage gated and it is gated by depolarization. Before we discuss this channel, let us try to understand what we mean by the term rectifier and what is a delayed rectifier at that. When we use the term rectifier, we use it for a channel that permits the pass passage of current in only one direction. Now let's look at this graph which shows you the current that is developed at different voltages. And if you look at the current that is developed 
for a particular change in voltage that will give you the slope of this line. So the slope of this line provides the conductance or the current per unit voltage. Now if you look at the slope, the slope in the positive direction is exactly the same as the slope in the negative direction. Now if you look at this particular graph, we see that the slope in both directions is the same or the conductance of outward currents is the same as the conductance of inward currents. So this particular graph shows you that there is no rectification happening at all. In contrast, let's look at this graph. We can see that at hyperpolarized voltages, this particular ion channel does not pass any current, but at depolarized voltages, this ion channel permits an outward current. So this particular ion channel passes only an outward current and you can see the conductance which is given by this slope, but there is no possibility of passing an inward current. So this is an example of outward rectification or an ion channel that passes only an outward current preferentially. If we look at this graph, this is an example of a channel that permits only an inward current or this is inward rectification. Now it's important to remember that most channels are not pure rectifiers. It's not that they do not permit any current in one particular direction. They may have a preference. They may preferentially permit outward currents or they may permit outward currents with a much higher conductance than the inward currents that they permit. So very few channels are pure rectifiers. Let us now discuss the delayed rectifier potassium channel. What do we know about it? We know that it's gated by depolarization of the membrane above the threshold. Its selectivity is for potassium. Where is it present? It's present on neurons, skeletal muscles and in the heart. What is its function? This is important for the downstroke of the action potential or repolarization of the action potential. This is seen in neurons, skeletal muscles and in cardiac muscle cells. So if we look at the action potential, the repolarization is because of opening of delayed rectifier potassium channels. Now we talked about rect rectification and we said that these are outward rectifiers, they permit an outward current preferentially. But why delayed? That's because these channels open with a slight delay as opposed to the voltage gated sodium channels which open very rapidly. The voltage gated potassium channels open with a slight delay. So therefore these are called delayed rectifier potassium channels. Their typical current profile would look similar to this where they are closed at hyperpolarized voltages and as the membrane gets depolarized at a particular threshold they start permitting current passage and they are outward rectifiers so you see outward currents due to potassium exit from the cell. Now let us summarize what we have learnt so far. We've talked about the action potential and we said that the depolarization of the action potential is due to opening of voltage gated sodium channels. We said that the repolarization is due to the opening of delayed rectifier potassium channels and we said that the resting membrane potential is determined by the leak potassium channels which contribute to the membrane permeability. So what we have studied up till now is we have studied three important class, classes of ion channels which contribute to action potentials.